you for being here. Uh, great, uh, great to have you here. Thank you. Um, I have a background in electronics, and there is a. Um, That's shocking, by the way. Yes, <laughs> just see. Appreciate it. Um, out there, we're for for me, it's for our young adults in our in our country that are, have to face this this stuff. I've already been through it. We've already been through it as an adult. But for me, it's a, for our children. Right. I have to. Think. So, but anyway, there's a, there's a, a, a something out there that's called astroturfing, which is an organization activity intended to create a false impression of widespread spontane spontaneously arising grassroots movement support and an opposition to uh, to something such as political policy, but a reality, and in, initiated and controlled by concealed group or organizations. In other words. It's the ten percent that wants to control the ninety percent, which yeah. we're the ninety percent. Sure. So now what we have the problem is is when we hear and see this, the folks are thinking, "Oh gosh, it's the the whole world wants it," and the problem is it's not. And then it, it, we just need to how to filter that out. It could be our our religious feelings or beliefs, or it could be something else. But it's hard for because we have media. This is all. This is a necessary evil. Like. Uh, Technology is a necessary evil. Right. They're using that against us, and I'm just our, our politicians, or how do we need to filter that out? Well, that's very, very difficult to answer because of the magnitude of the problem. Okay, it used to be because the information slow flow was so slow by comparison. Uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, before you had all this d digital wonder, this magical thing called the iPhone or smartphones, you know. But now everybody has them and, you know, kids have them. It's just amazing. And it's, it's a powerful tool for, pardon me for using this word, but misinformation. Of course, now that's often used against true information. And the fake news is the real information kind of thing. But this is part of the concern. And how do you um, figure out what's actually true, given all the disinformation that's coming down? How do you know if it's disinformation or not? OK, I, I'm going to make a recommendation of a source uh, to go to that I think is really reliable um, that you may have heard of. But I want to give you a principle first. And here's a principle. When people cheat with regards to advancing information and you could see it, that's a red flag and it, cause, and it should cause you to mistrust the information. Okay, so what's a cheat? A cheat is for uh, informal fallacies is a cheat. So calling somebody a name instead of dealing with an idea, that's a cheat. So when you see some person promoting these ideas and then their opposition are all called names, that's the way they deal with the opposition. That's a cheat. Instead of dealing with the issue, they just call names. Maybe they don't have any good support for the issue that they're promoting. That's one red flag. Another one is uh, when, when they misrepresent the view that they're criticizing. They're advancing their view. They mi misrepresent the opposing view, and then they knock it down easily. This is called a straw man fallacy, but you don't need to know the words just when you see it coming. Um, these are uh, happen all the time, and it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle they happen on. When they happen, they're cheats, okay? And this should cause you to distrust. The biggest cheat is trying to silence the opposition. Whenever I see the opposition being silenced aggressively, okay, that gives me that makes me wonder if the people doing the silencing because they have the power have a case, okay. And so there are a lot of issues going on now that I, I don't know. I don't do a deep dive in all of this stuff. But when I see one side trying to silence the other, that makes me distrust them. Why do they do that? Why not let the best idea win? This requires public discussion. But there's silencing going everywhere. So this is just an insight that will help you in general. Um, I will tell you what I think, and you, some may not agree with this, but that's all right. A really great source of information that's in bite-sized pieces, and I trust the information because they deal with the ideas with facts and information, and they don't trade in rhetoric is Prager University. How many people know about Prager U? Okay, a lot of you do. Dennis Prager is kind of the namesake of that enterprise. He is the, in my view, 
other than the president of the United States, the most influential individual in the country because he gets a billion and a half views a year on his things. And he does because he actually persuades, he's conservative and he's Jewish, not a Christian, but he's a friend of Christians. And he actually gets people to change their mind, lots and lots and lots of people, because he's fairly putting forth the facts. So it is worthwhile to go to PragerU and look at their little vignettes. They are five minutes long. That's it. I did one of them, too, on the issue of tolerance, the intolerance of tolerance. But, uh, but mine isn't the most often viewed. There's a lot of others, a wide range of topics. So that's what I would suggest as a source of quick information. Right here, front row. Yes, ma'am. Um, simple question. I have a friend that I've known probably, I don't know, 35 years, used to work with her. And so I just would like your thoughts on her, one of her responses. Um, she happens to be Jewish. Um, she asked me if I would go to shul or reformed synagogue with her. I said, absolutely. But Good I do you. require you to come to a Messianic congregation with me. Fine, no problem. Okay, trade off. Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fair. And it worked out beautifully. She wasn't offended. She thought that I had notified everybody that she was coming because they were so kind to her. Mm -hmm. But that obviously wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and I appreciated Shul because of Messianic Judaism. I knew what was going on. I could say the prayers the whole nine yards. Sure. No big deal. So time, No big deal. I could say the prayers. Uh, no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Okay. It's, good. Not, it's not really. Anyway, um, she had an issue with a neighbor. And she contacted me about this issue, and this neighbor, very front, up front, said, you know, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. And while that would not have been my approach, and it's never been my approach with her, I will give her all Old Testament scripture. So this final incident, I took the privilege of sending her a really great video of an interview with a Jewish man on the street and how he saw the truth because the way the gospel was presented, right, he believed right. in Jesus. Okay. Right. So um, she got very perturbed with me by that. and Because you sent the video. Yeah. That would explain the answer to her challenge, right? This is yes. interesting. Yes, and she <laughs> says, this is your truth, not my religion. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know that she hangs on to her mother's Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. So what do I say, what is the connection there between truth and her religion. Yeah, okay, this is, well, what she's done here is she has used the word truth in a relativistic sense, signified by the word you as an adjective, uh, your, rather, as an adjective, all right? So, I mean, there's numbers of ways you could go. One of the re ways I would, uh, one of the things I would ask, just came to me, is, uh, and this is a tactical approach, okay? Uh, and I, I actually talk about this particular point in a different book I wrote that it's going to be available called The Story of Reality, how people use the word truth the way they use it, okay? And, uh, and my point is, the question I'd ask would be this. Well, you called it my truth. Why would you use the word truth? Do you think that my view is correct? No, then why would you use the word truth to describe it? Just a friendly, just I'm curious. Now, what are you trying to do is you're trying to unwrap and defuse this misuse of language. Okay, so it's not really my truth. It's the thing I believe that you think is false. No, I don't think it's false. Oh, well, then what do you do think about? Well, I have my religion and you have yours. Now, notice she's talking about religions like clubs. Now, is that an insulin or an ice cream approach to religion? This is an ice cream approach. You see that? Okay, that's how this paradigm I've offered you can really help you understand what's going on in these conversations. You have your religious club. Let's get rid of the truth word, because that's misleading. If your view isn't accurate, if it's not a fact, then it's not a truth of any kind. It may be your belief, it may be your mistake, it may be whatever, but it's not a truth. Okay, so, and so, the, so you have your view, she has your, hers, but the word truth doesn't even apply to either one the way she's talking about it. Because if she really believed that her form of Judaism was accurate to the world, then you should believe what she believes. But she doesn't want to say that because that would be intolerant, okay? And so notice that her view is ice cream, not insulin, okay? So that's, that's the word truth. Uh, here's kind of ironic about your question. I was actually asked that question 
about salvation. Do you need to believe in Jesus? Do Jews need to believe in Jesus to go to, he to, go to heaven or are they going to hell? By Dennis Prager on a stage like this in front of an audience full of Jews. I've known Dennis for a long time, as it turns out. You know, I know it's name dropping, but um, it's worth it's the truth. I, I, I had a joke about that. You know, people say you shouldn't drop names. Yeah, Dennis Prager told me that once. You know, it's like, <laughs> but anyway, the fact is we've been friends for a long time. Okay. And I've been in radio with, shows with him back in the 80s. Anyway, so he had invited me to this thing and he asked me this question. And I said, you know, if I just answered the way your friend answered, if I just gave you the bald truth of it, it would sound like I was anti-Semitic. And so I said, I'm, let me try to explain it. And so this is the way I think you should respond if you're asked the question like that so people have a sense of things. I said, the temptation for us is to look down, to think that God looks down at the world and sees all these religious clubs and plays favorites. And for a lot of time, he played favorites with the Jewish club. And then he got really mad at the Jewish club. And so then now he favors the Christian club and to hell with all the rest of them, you know, quite literally. So, uh, but that's a mistake. What God doesn't look at religious clubs. He looks down at human beings that he has made to be in friendship with him and to obey his law. And to a person, we have violated his law many times, which means we're guilty. So God established a rescue operation. And the rescue operation is he sent his son to pay for, as a Paschal lamb, pay for the sins of all people, not just Jewish people. And if you put your trust in him, then he pays for you. And if you don't put your trust in him, then you pay for yourself. Okay, that's it. Now, now do you see how that sounds so different if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell? This gives us some sense of it. And this is what I do in that book, Story of Reality, to try to build this out a little bit more so people have a clear understanding. So it's up to you. You can do what you want. This is God's provision. This is God's plan. Now, the real question isn't whether it's narrow-minded, because look, at the, look, what is the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. Is that narrow? Absolutely. It excluded all the pagan religions in the ancient Near East. Okay? That's their law. Okay? So Judaism at the source from Moses is very narrow, okay? And there's lots of examples in Hebrew scripture where God acted in a narrow way. There is a way to be saved and there's a way to be lost. And we need to make the distinction about what that is, okay? It can be said in harsh ways or communicated in a way that isn't pleasant or friendly. Maybe accurate, but it's not palatable. Or we could be careful as ambassadors for Christ and try to communicate it in a palatable way. And I, that's what I suggest. And maybe there'll be an opportunity for you with your friend in that regard, okay? Now, um, you know, I'm not trying to sell books because I'm not selling anything. They're for free. They're giving them away. The church has already bought them, okay? But there, there's a section in the story of reality that's all about Jesus and the cross. It's the last part, okay? And uh, Jesus' cross, or you know, that explains what I just described in more detail, and hopefully in a way in an ancient Near Eastern con a sense that people nowadays will understand. So I, I suggest something like that to her. Getting your work out today, Mr. J. Yep. Hi, thank you. Um, so I believe that with a lot of my arguments that I make on a day-to-day -day basis that I tend to go with the ice cream approach. Huh. As context, I am Gen Z, theater major, living in California, I feel like I, for a while, had to hide who I was and what right. I believed in. And so I was always going for the, oh, well, you believe in this, but here's all of my reasons. Yeah. And I feel like that came to a head during the whole pandemic scare and especially with the vaccines. So I went through and had my whole list of reasons but at the end you of mean the reasons day, regarding the concerns about vaccines? Yeah, Is that what you're talking about? Okay. Concerns about vaccines because I had like clubs and stuff that I wasn't able to attend because they were all aboard I know, I... what Big Pharma was selling gotcha. them, but I wasn't convinced. Right. And so I would give my reasons and state that I believe that everyone should make the decision for themselves, but these are my reasons why I'm hesitant. Right. And it completely destroyed a friendship that I had. 
Um, no, let me. Can you? Uh, can I interrupt for just a second? I, I don't understand. Well, I, I do understand, but I'm just drawing attention to it. Why would when you give your reasons for a contrary view? Now, I'm just going to be charitable here. I presume you're as nice to the person you're talking to as you are to me now. I don't know. Are you kind of? Is that true, or are you kind of feisty? I'm I'm pretty nice. Okay, um, yeah. I, I like to think I am. I guess that's All something right. that other uh, people could no, say. No, but, but the thing is, I suspect you are. Mm -hmm. But because you disagreed, you got canceled. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. This is what happens in our culture. It's power, not truth. All right? And so this is why, okay, you don't agree with me. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to punish you by, by, you wouldn't do that to your friends. And hopefully you're not doing that to your friends as Christians because that's not the Christian way. That's not Christ's way. But, but nevertheless, that's the way people act towards us. I, I'm just making the observation. It's yeah. so unfortunate. Even if you make a case, people say, I don't want anything to do with you. You know, I, I, no, I presume it wasn't because you said it destroyed the relationship. So, so uh, right? A little bit of context is like she was throwing a... a party and was asking if I could go. I was like, oh yeah, of course. And then a week later she was like, oh yeah, and you just have to show proof of vaccination after I had given her all of my reasons and she had stated, oh yeah, that oh, yeah, makes yeah. sense. And you so said no. It was an underhanded method and I said, hey, thank you for the invitation. You know my stance on this. Uh -huh. I hope that we could hang out later, but I'm not going to abide by those rules so I won't be showing up at your house yeah. party. And then a couple weeks later she texts me saying, oh, I wish that you would get vaccinated. That way we could hang out again. Like, okay, so that was, okay, well, it was a little different then, but the, the condition like of, reaching out look at that, was she vaccinated? Yes. Okay, what's she worried about? She's covered. That's what I, I, I mean, saying. that's it's common sense. Anyway, so I don't want to get into that issue, but it's, <laughs> It's just it's just crazy. So um, in any event, um, there I, you, I want to go back to what you said at first, because you said, I think I'm making my view an ice cream kind of view. OK, uh, that is, in my sense, the way you explained it. You were giving the reasons why you actually believe vaccinations are harmful and not or not necessary or not helpful or whatever. <clears throat> Without taking a side on the issue, you were giving your rationale. She didn't agree. You have a difference of opinion. OK, my concern is when Christians say, well, I believe the Christian view is this or I believe such and so or according to my faith, thus and so. OK, those are ways of characterizing your views that I do think in the minds of people relativizes your view. The minute you say this is my faith, they think blind or leap of, okay? Or this is my belief. Well, that's just your personal belief. So I don't use words like that. I never used them at all when we were talking about here. I talked about my convictions, all right? And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything like believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Um, that doesn't mean anything. That's religious noise to non-Christians. And the word believe then relativizes it. All right, somewhat. I just, I want people to put their trust in Jesus of Nazareth and follow him forever. <laughs> that's what I'm after. So that's the way I'm going to communicate it. So maybe the, I don't know about your relationship with your friend. That may be a genuine difference of opinion. And she feels unsafe around an unzac vaccinated person. All right, I guess. So, okay, that's the way it is. But uh, when you're talking about your things that you're not sure about, it's okay to say, well, this is my view or this is my belief. But when you're talking about you've given your life to Christ, you're living your life as if it were true. That's like your conviction. You think this is the case. We're talking gravity here. We're not talking Haggadahs, right? Okay, so um, that's the way you should communicate it. And my recommendations for the rest of you is quit talking about your faith. Talk about your convictions. Don't say I'm a person of faith. You know what people hear? Good for you. I'm glad you found something. Talk about your convictions about, here's what I think. And, and, and I have said this before to people just so they're not confused. What I'm talking about is Christianity being true. And I mean true like gravity is true. Okay, true like gravity is true. You know, so they, they, you know, to jog them out of that way of thinking. Okay. Does that help? Okay, right Thank here. You. Oh, um, I have a friend who we talk about God a lot. She, Great. She was a Christian, then she kind of fell away. Now she's an atheist. I'll put that in quotes. Right. I think in her heart she right. believes. 
But she says to me, if God is truly loving and doesn't want anybody to perish, why did he even set up this battle of good and evil in the first place? Okay, uh, there's an assumption here that's made. By the way, this is a, a common question, and it's a, somewhat difficult to answer because it starts out after the preliminaries, why did God, or why didn't God, sometimes it's like that. And these are questions that almost never can be answered because we're asking what's in the mind of the omniscient God who sees everything and we only see some things. And we don't get it, we don't understand that. So that, that's, a, that's, a, a, that, that, that's already difficult to answer, all right? But you don't need to answer that question, in my view, to be able to come to an accurate conclusion that there is a loving, powerful God. Okay, and I just did it with the moral argument that I offered. You know, if there's evil, there's got to be a God who sets the standard. And if, he's, if the standard is a good standard, we acknowledge that. That's why we call its violation evil. Therefore, the one who sets the standard has to be good. <laughs> Or else he's not going to set a good standard, you know, so you get a good God out of that, too. And again, I go into a lot more detail on this in the book coming out called Street Smarts. But um, the presumption, she made a presumption from what you characterize, and that was, why did God set up the system with all the good and evil? Okay, so I would ask the question, what does your question just assume? Well, she doesn't know because she isn't thinking about it. Well, it assumes that God set up the good and evil system. Why would you think God set up the evil system? Where, where, why would you think it implies that he's responsible for the evil? Why would God make me this way, people say? Why would God make me such and so? Why would God make people do bad things? So that's part of their question. Wait a minute. Why did you assume that God made people to do that? That's not our view. If you want to critique our view, that's fine. But make sure it's our view that you're critiquing, not something else. In our view, God didn't do that. God made a world that was good. And what I mean by good here is that it was all the way it was supposed to be and everything was working just the way he intended it to work. You see, God set up the world for the purpose of human flourishing. We read in chapter 1 of Genesis and chapter 2 of Genesis all the different things that God did. Male and female, he created them, right? In the image of God, he created them. Be fruitful, multiply, which kind of requires male and female. Subdue the earth, okay? All of these things are part of a system that he made so that we would do well in the system, all right? Next chapter, marriage, a certain way. Leave mother, father, man, cleaves to wife. The two become one flesh. That's the sexual part and more, but at least that. And Jesus said, what God joins together, let no man separate, Matthew 19. This is a system God made. That's all good. What happened? Human beings made it bad. And we made it bad by our bad choices. We chose to disobey. Which, by the way, and you can, it depends on the nature of your relationship and the conversation and where you're at in the conversation, but it's appropriate to say, which you do too, <laughs> disobey. Like when I was talking to Berkeley. Here's God's law. We all know that there's a, a rules out there. We all know that we've broken them. I'm talking to a group. It's easier. But when you're one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that too. Okay, I was, today, I picked up my F-150 in front of the hotel to drive here. The guy gave me the ticket, and he was waiting for the car to come out, and I'm just making small conversation. I don't have these conversations with everybody, but I just, he said, he said, um, uh, so why are you in town? And I said, well, I'm teaching at the church, Beach City, it's down the way, last night and this morning. And, uh, and uh, no, I said I was, what I said was, I, I was, a, uh, well, uh, he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a public speaker and a writer. Oh, well, what got you into public speaking? I said, well, you don't just get into public speaking. You got to have something to say, <laughs> you know? And I said, I, I, first I got into Jesus, or Jesus got into me, and then I had something to say, okay? So he asked me what my favorite verse is, and I, my favorite verse is, uh, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Okay, that's 2 Corinthians 4. I'm not going to tell that to a non-Christian. He didn't make any sense. Yeah, being a Christian is a total bummer, man. You don't want to do that, right? <laughs> Okay, so I said, I got another one for you. I said, this is Jesus. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I said, every one of us is going to stand before Jesus and give an account for our lives. And that's not going to be a pretty picture. And that's what I offered him, right? I'm talking to the individual now. But notice that this is like in your face, believe in Jesus you're, if you're, or you're going to hell. I just kind of made it clear and I left something to Jesus, that, which I think is really profound, easy to remember. 
for him to think about. Okay, and so there are sometimes in conversations it's fair just to be straightforward about that, you know, and and uh, and, and get people thinking about what's at risk. And if you can, if you can give them some reasons to take that seriously, then all the better. So, okay, does that help? Thanks. Got one last more right here. We got four minutes. Um, when you're in a debate with someone about their relativistic views and they use the cheat code, how do you counteract that or continue? They use the, conversation? the what code? The cheat code you mentioned? Oh, the gene? Like cheat. The cheat code. Oh, the cheat. Oh, they call you names? Is yes. that what you mean? Yeah. I asked them, why, they, why did you change the subject? And they say, well, what do you mean change the subject? We, we were just talking about morality, and now you're, you're calling me, you know, whatever, something bad. And by the way, and I'm just kind of in role-playing mode again, by the way, you're a relativist, right? Yeah. Well, what you just called me, like a bigot? What's wrong with being a bigot if you're a relativist? Even if it's true that I'm a bigot, how is that wrong if you're a relativist? See, I'm, I'm trying to play their rules back on them, and I'm trying to use a question to do that. Questions I mentioned earlier keep you safe. The minute you ask a question, you're not making claims, so you're not vulnerable. Okay, you're just asking the question. You toss the ball back into their court. Now it's their turn, and you're just waiting to hear what they respond. And lots of times you're going to get, okay, 60s alert here. You're going to get what I call the Simon and Garfunkel response. <laughs> Did you ever hear of those guys? Yeah. yeah, okay. They're still alive, but they're really old, okay? They wrote a song in 1966 called The Sounds of Silence, yeah. all right? And that's what you're going to get when you ask an appropriate question that really is meant to to, you know, jar their thinking legitimately, they don't know what to do because they have never thought about it before. No one's ever pointed that out to them before. And sometimes even for them, there's going to be an aha moment, just like Gil, the physical therapist. Now, he had an aha moment about one thing, but then he, you know, he fell into his own trap a few seconds later. But I want people to start thinking about their view. We've got two minutes and 30 seconds. Can we try one more? Right here. Do you ever have people take that tactic back on you? Oh, like, sure. Like after you explained uh, the, the Jew question, right? Oh, so you do think Jews are going to hell. Like how do you, like do they pinpoint you back into Oh, oh, oh I see. If they yeah. roll me back into that right. thing. Okay. Exactly. Uh, yes, uh, they could do that. Uh, to put it simply, what I think is, just to make it precise, I think anybody who doesn't get forgiven is going to have to pay. Do you think people who do bad things, my question now, do you think people who do bad things ought to pay? What do you think? Yeah. We got prisons, we got police, people do bad things. You ever say, how did, he got away with murder, he got away with theft. The people are getting away with all kinds, does that bother you? Okay, all I'm saying is there's justice, that's all I'm saying. Okay, have you ever done any bad things? I actually asked, asked this of an attorney once, it was at Barnes & Noble, I had given a presentation years ago. Uh, and, and, I, he, he, and he said, why do I need Jesus? I'm a Jew. Why do I need Jesus? I said, do you think people who do bad things ought to be punished? That was my question. This is in the relativism book, by the way. Um, and, and he said, well, since I'm a prosecuting attorney, yeah. You know, I didn't know that about him, but we have a general intuition that people who do bad things ought to pay. I said, okay, I agree with you. Okay, now, second question. Uh, have you ever done any bad things? He says, yeah, I guess I have. Somebody say, no, I haven't. I say, I want to talk to your wife <laughs> or your kids or whatever, you know, your roommate. Okay. And so he said, yeah, I guess I have. And I said, so have I. I said, notice we're in agreement on these two things. People who do bad things ought to be punished and, and we've done bad things. I, I said, do you know what I call that? What? Bad news. <laughs> it's bad news, right? Okay. So then that sets up a circumstance with the questions to now explain salvation, substitutionary atonement. Okay, we're in trouble. There's a it's like the judge is looking down at us. We know we're guilty. And if the judge says, are you interested in a pardon? So if you're, she's a Jewish person, you can just ask her. So just so she understands, or your friend or whoever it is, do you think it would be people who do bad things ought to be punished? That's Judaism. Have we done any bad, th you done any bad? Yes, that's Judaism. Are you interested in a pardon? I mean, that's what's the next question. Now the question is, where is the pardon and how does the pardon come? 
Okay. And it's irrespective of their Judaism. The point is, if you don't receive a pardon, then you receive punishment for what you already know you agree. You already agree uh, uh, you've done wrong. Okay. Now, just to help you see the tactical point, if you're just stuck with that question and you just give an answer, it is not shrewd. It's accurate, but it's not shrewd. Notice how I'm asking questions to cause the, the sense of, um, of a moral intuition about justice to come to the surface and their awareness of their own wrong. So what's so weird about this? We both, we're guilty. We know we ought to be punished. There's a solution. The discussion is what the solution is. Let's talk about that. That's the real issue. It's not whether Jews are going to hell because they're Jewish. No, they're not going to hell because they're Jewish. They're going to hell because they're sinners, just like I am. The Gentile. People don't go to hell because they're any particular religion. When the books are open, they are judged according to their deeds. That's an act of justice. And what happens with those whose names are in the book of life is they don't get justice, which they do deserve. They get mercy, which they don't deserve. Okay. All right, Mr. J. All right. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you.